There it is. Uh, so welcome everyone. This is the Lake Working Group uh, interim meeting. Uh, my name is Malish Ravucinic and uh, my co-chair is Stephen. Can you hear us? Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm Stephen. Yeah, so uh, to the, so essentially just as a quick reminder, this is an ITF meeting. Uh, the meeting is recorded and the presence is logged. Uh, the note will apply and notably if you're aware of any IPR issues, you are requested to disclose them to the working group. So here is the proposed agenda for the day. Uh, essentially, we will be going through a couple of uh, reports, uh, one on the latest interop testing event that uh, Marco led, uh, I believe, and then uh, Stefan will give us a report on the performance evaluation of his uh, ad hoc implementation for constraint devices. After that, essentially, the plan is to go through the uh, through the diff of the latest ad hoc draft compared to the 05 version and then to jump into the open issues. So does anyone want to bash this agenda? I hear none, so I propose then that we get started. And the first, the first item on the agenda today is Marco and the interop report. So let me just. There it is. So Marco, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So just okay. let me know when you want me to switch slides. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi everyone. This is a short summary of the test we had. Um, after uh, ITF 110 uh, till the latest bigger event we had recently. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this covers both some uh, bilateral spontaneous tests we organized after ITF 110 and a, a bigger two hour event we had on, on April 14. And overall, we cover uh, five implementations. Uh, some were coming again for more tests. Uh, we had also um, a new one uh, from Peter van der Stock. Um, so overall, 10-ish people attended, uh, testers or observers, and we kept on building on the same set of documents uh, on the Google Drive. So uh, a cumulative spreadsheet where we keep track of um, which implementation from whom supports what and what they tested with what uh, configuration setting. And together with that, we have also for each pair of implementers uh, a text document uh, collecting the, the settings they especially tested and, and the detailed result. Next slide, please. So a bit more info on the different tests. Um, I had some with Peter van der Stock, uh, an implementation, as I mentioned, we focused on um, Cypher Suites 2 and 3. And for both of them, we tested all four uh, authentication methods. Uh, but focusing on uh, certificates, X5 chain, and uh, especially real X509 certificates in this case. And notably, to the best of my knowledge, it was the first time that uh, two implementations ever uh, could test uh, those particular uh, features list here as bullets. So Cypress with three, uh, the two methods one, two, and X5 chain, uh, not to mention real um, certificates. Uh, we consider only uh, one from because of um, reachability setup issues, but uh, that worked all fine. Next slide, please. Otherwise, I could test during the uh, biggest event with Stefan. Uh, we consider Cypress with zero, and we could cover both authentication methods zero and three, uh, focused on um, X5D. Um, it worked, uh, again, only in that direction. Stefan as initiator and me as responder uh, for the same uh, reachability reasons. Next slide, please. Uh, and finally, uh, we, we converge with three implementa implementations from uh, Christian, Timothy, and me, um, focusing on Cypress with zero, authentication method uh, three. There were earlier tests between me and Christian with authentication method zero, and, and KID again. So Timothy and Christian can actually test uh, in both directions, 
uh, for lack of time, uh, Kristen and I could test this particular configuration only in one uh, direction. Uh, so this is the, the full uh, collection of setup we tested. Uh, it's still highlighted in, in green uh, in the spreadsheet on the Google Drive mentioned before. And yeah, basically everything we tested um, worked out fine. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, as they said, the things you learn uh, from implementation, especially testing, uh, that was the occasion to also build up uh, feedback that resulted into more issues for the drafts. Uh, we plan to have some more spontaneous bilateral testing, especially Christian, Timothy, and me in, in the coming weeks. Otherwise, the plan is to have another two hours or so event around uh, mid uh, mid May, second half of May. Uh, we, we'll surely start to doodle for that. And that was all from my side. Thank you, Marco. So uh, I have a, maybe a, a question or two just regarding. So my understanding, I always like to point out new uh, new implementations. And my understanding is that Peter's implementation is uh, has been tested for the first time during the interop events. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, was this is uh, Pete is Peter with us? I think I saw his name. Yeah. Uh, so this is a C based implementation. This is a C based implementation. Could you tell us more about this implementation, Peter? Uh, it's based on lib co op. Uh, I also have implemented the ED25519, but unfortunately, the embed TLS library only supports this partially. So I'm still waiting. End of Q4, embed TLS should also support this part, and then the whole thing should work. Okay, so this so this was executed on a, on a desktop machine. I understand. Not uh, no, 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 no. It was executed on a Pi four and on a desktop. Okay. And then, Marco, question for you, or maybe for Christian, because uh, so the, the, when you refer to Christian's implementation, is this Pi ad hoc with IO co-op, or is this something else? Uh, can you move to slide? Two or three, I think we, we had the list did there. I, uh, yeah. Did I miss that? Should have been there. Christian is building his own implementation, but considering very much as oh, okay. uh, Timothy's implementation in Python. Oh, okay, okay, I see. So when you say Christian, so this is IOQA building on the yeah. Python. Okay, yeah, okay, sorry, I missed that. All right. Uh, these details are also in the spreadsheet, by the way, uh, also with links to the implementations. Okay. This one, this this link here, I suppose. All right, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Marco? Uh, I hear none, so I propose we uh, move on to the next agenda item, uh, which is the evaluation of Stefan's uh, implementation on constrained devices. Stefan, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Also from my side. Um, so, what I will present today is uh, partially um, it's a part of uh, a paper which uh, we get accepted uh, on the Kudaspi conference, uh, which will um, take place next week. Okay. Next slide, please. So generally, we have two um, um, ad hoc implementations, one for regular microcontrollers and also Linux um, capable devices. So this is the implementation which I use during all the uh, interoperability testings. And we also have um, one second implementation, which is for microcontrollers with a trusted execution environment, such as uh, trust zone M. Next slide, please. So for the um, for our, so our ad hoc library for microcontrollers with a trusted execution environment. Um, so here uh, on the right side uh, you see um, the separation of this library. So generally we cons consider as critical all um, ad hoc keys and uh, all cryptographic operations which we execute in the secure world. And uh, in the non-secure world is basically the complete logic of the protocol. 
and when we have a call from the non-secure in the secure world, we um, just have reference to the key which should be used. Next slide, please. So for our evaluation, so we evaluated uh, Cypher Suite 0. Um, we evaluated uh, ad hoc both with um, pre-shared keys, but also with certificates, and namely CBOR certificates, um, native CBOR certificates. Um, for the crypto operations, we used um, um, software implementations, namely TinyCrypt and C5519. Um, so the evaluation of the ad hoc library for regular microcontrollers uh, was done on four different microcontrollers, uh, namely Cortex-M0, um, an ASP32 Extensa microcontroller, and Cortex-M4 and Cortex-M33. And the evaluation of the implementation for microcontrollers with a trusted execution environment uh, was done on a Cortex-M33 with Trustzone m Next slide. Uh, so first, uh, regarding the message sizes on the left, um, we see um, generally um, a matrix uh, where we list all possible combinations. So we can have authentication with uh, Diffie-Hellman keys, uh, with signatures, um, but also authentication with uh, certificates, uh, which can hold either a signature key or a Diffie-Hellman key. And we did evaluation for the cases on the diagonal. And uh, this is the message sizes for those cases are shown in the table on the right. Um, so here, um, the messages, um, what we can say, messages are short, even in the case where we have um, real, uh, where we have certificates, uh, which is, uh, of course, the most um, flexible, uh, so to say, case, uh, we have um, pretty uh, short messages. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we see um, the flash requirements of our regular, um, of our implementation for regular microcontrollers. So here, the flash requirements are divided uh, in requirements for the crypto and um, requirements for the ad hoc logic. And uh, what we can say here is um, that um, crypto and protocol logic are roughly equivalent, so roughly 10K. Um, and in total, um, we are between 17 to 20K on the different um, microcontroller architectures. So next slide, please. So on this slide, we see the RAM requirements uh, for, the, for our ad hoc implementation without uh, a trusted execution environment. Um, so here, uh, it is important to say uh, that um, generally requester and responder have very similar uh, requirements and they, um, um, so when, when, when certificates are used, they're roughly around 4k and when um, raw public keys are used they're roughly 2.5k next slide please so on this slide we see um, the computing time um, on the left uh, for the initiator on the right for the responder for the four uh, different cases, um, for the four different combinations of certificates, uh, raw public keys, and uh, static Diffie-Hellman in signature keys cases. Um, here, um, what is important to say is um, that on weaker devices, such as um, the Cortex-M0, um, device which we tested, which uh, runs at 16 megahertz. In the cases where we have, um, let's say, uh, where we have signature keys and certificates, 
this can take uh, some time up to uh, 39 seconds um, so that was um, actually the, um, the the operation which took um, longest but on other architectures let's say the ESP32 we have the same operations for around three seconds so next slide please on this slide, um, we see um, the same um, so, uh, for the implementation with a trusted execution environment. So on the top uh, are the flash requirements, which are separated first uh, for flash requirements in the secure world, for flash requirements in the non-secure world, and then the sum of both, which is the, the third group of uh, bars from the top. and then um, in the last group we have um, the case when we don't have a trusted execution environment um, so here um, the overhead in the flash requirements is roughly around 2k on the bottom left side we see the ram requirements uh, again um, separated for secure world non-secure world the sum of both and uh, then as last the um, the case when the trust zone is not used so here we see that uh, we have um, some um, increase in the RAM requirements this is due to the fact that when we have a trusted execution environment we have um, generally two virtual processors with two separate stacks and um, this is why uh, the RAM cannot be reused so efficiently, but at the end, um, the numbers are really very, very low, and this is not um, not a problem for any state-of-the-art microcontroller. In the figure on the right, we see um, the computing time uh, compared to the um, case when um, uh, when uh, so comparison between trust zone is used and trust zone is not used and here uh, we have very insignificant uh, difference uh, below one percent uh, which means so from that means that from computing time perspective we don't have um, so any limitations or uh, disadvantages next slide please so, uh, was, so as last, um, I want to mention that uh, we put our implementation for uh, devices without a trust zone um, as open source. Um, this implementation is available under permissive licenses, namely uh, MIT or Apache on your option. So everyone can use it to build uh, commercial products and does not uh, need to so it's it's very very uh, very open um, ongoing is currently an integration in Zephyr OS uh, which will hopefully happen very soon I'm um, we're in a good contact with Zephyr and then um, this uh, implementation will be usable out of the box on Zephyr uh, OS and as last point, which is very important to me, is to mention that um, we uh, we are looking for collaboration and further improving um, our implementation. And I will be happy if um, if there are people who uh, want to support us and want to work in this project. Um, just don't hesitate and um, write me an email or just talk to me thank you very much that was the last sw slide yes okay thank you uh, thank you Stefan so uh, yeah so th this is very interesting thank you thank you for presenting this to the working book uh, I believe this is the first exhaustive performance study of an ad hoc implementation that we've seen and it's really good to, to have this quantified uh, so uh, I don't. I have a couple of uh, maybe one question. I was I was struck by the uh, by the figure that you gave uh, of thirty seconds computation time for the signature operation. So, 
that was that oh, yeah it was yes. this one yeah yes yeah so and then you said that you did not use this with an with an os so i guess uh, the processor was monopolized during this time right uh like when you do the computation i mean 30 seconds um so um this is um the core this is a cortex m0 okay running. um so this is really very weak microcontroller um which runs at 16 megahertz and um we are using a software implementation so this microcontroller especially does not have uh, a acceler accelerator for um asymmetric operations and this is something which takes a lot on this small device. Okay, yeah, uh, I see. So, so which curve is this? Does um, this relate this, to? Uh, yes, this is Cypher Suit Zero with uh, um, X two five five one nine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but it's, yeah. I, I was surprised by that. I mean, I had. Uh, I mean, I had done some experiments. Uh, with NIST curves in the past, but this was on uh, Cortex M3, I believe, and this was on the order at a similar frequency. Uh, I, I think it, it was 12 to 16 megahertz, and I think the the figure I remember was a couple of seconds. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's so a bit surprising. Yeah, it very depends on the on the clock speed. For example, the ESP32 runs at 10 times higher speed, and then the if you if you just uh, look a bit down, you will see that it is roughly ten times faster. So it um, depends to the high extent, of course. This is on, the, the on on the frequent on the processor frequency, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So, but do we have any comments or questions? Uh, John Matson here, Ericsson. So, if I interpret this correctly, basically, the dominating factor here is crypto. Yes. Crypto, crypto, yes. crypto. Yeah. Crypto, crypto, crypto. Um, so, um, note that um, the scale of the x axis is logarithmic. So, um, the, the blue bars, um, if you look at the blue bars, they're many thousand times shorter. For example, for the Cortex-M0 in the certificate case, we have 1.3 milliseconds for the logic and then more than 30 seconds for the crypto. So it is the crypto. The crypto is the, po uh, is the most um, um, time-consuming cooperation. Yeah, this, I mean, this is kind of expected, right? But uh, yes. still, uh, I'm surprised by the figure that you get. It's, it's a lot. I mean, I'm especially thinking in the context, for instance, of the six dish networks and the OpenWSN stack, where we don't have a support for multi threading, this would throw the uh, any nodes out of sync with the rest of the network. So, but uh, we, I mean, this, this is a problem that we need to solve, obviously. I think probably Timo could tell us more. But maybe a question for Timo. I know that Tim, uh, that Timothy has done uh, some uh, initial benchmarking of uh, of his implementation, the ad hoc C1. Timo, could you comment on if you have any preliminary results that you could share? Um, I don't really have any performance results on RAM usage of or computing time. Um, the only thing I've measured is flash, and for flash usage, we have roughly the same size. Uh, okay. For the ad hoc so, implementation, yeah. So, so these numbers are very representative then. Yeah. And yeah, that's on a on a Cortex M3. Uh, so we had around uh, between eight and ten k, depending on what you enable and what you don't enable. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry. So, uh, I, I had a question. Um, uh, also, just to remind people that. If, if be probably more relevant for the next agenda item, but if you want to join the mic line, you can just type Q plus or something in the, in the WebEx chat. Uh, so my question is just um, the licensing you have for the non TEE version is open source. Was yes. the TEE version, is there some restriction that prevented you doing that or was that just a decision or a timing um, issue? Yes, the, the reason for that is that um, 
um, I cannot um, maintain both uh, at the same time. So because the, um, of course the um, standardization and the versions with each version we have uh, changes and um, I need to keep both um, implementations more or less. Uh, um, so I need to keep both um, on the new version and that takes me a lot of time. And um, so we decided, uh, and it was also a bit of a political decision because uh, at the end, um, uh, so Fraunhofer Isaac is uh, looking also for customers and that was something like, we will put this um, non-T version outside and if there are people interested in the T version, we can provide that as um, under commercial license. Okay, great, thanks. But so there's no external, there's no external restriction causing that. It's just a, just happens that way. That's and that's fine. Thank you. Yes. Yes. All right. So if there are no other questions for Stefan, uh, I propose we go uh, go on with the next agenda agenda item, which is uh, the meat of the Mrs. meeting, the ad hoc draft and the open issues. So uh, we have a couple of slides uh, ready that uh, the authors prepared. Uh, so is uh, Joran uh, or John who, who will be presenting this? I can take these slides and then John will talk about the issues. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so yes, next slide, please. So we are now in version six of the draft. And I think the the probably best reason for having these in DREAMS is that we, it drives us to submit new versions. The current version was published yesterday. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's basically following the process, resolving issues, clarifications, and so on. And, and we need to, I think, if we didn't have this interim meeting, we might have just gone on, on the GitHub. And it's good to, to make these new, um, new versions from time to time so we see where we are. Um, and here's just I'd like to quickly go through this and then get on to the to the issues. So we have a uh, this new section um, outlining the message processing, which was uh, not not sufficiently detailed in the previous version. Uh, we have an optional initial byte in message one, a null byte which we discussed at ITF 110 uh, is now included, and um, the presence of this it depends on the agreement between the the initial agreement between initiator and responder as stated in what we call applicability statement. Uh, there are error messages, updates. So we have a new format that we discussed uh, with, with error codes. And there is a short table and there is a, a request to make an IANA registry. And uh, there's also a change in recommendation for how to use, how to transport errors with co-op uh, where we actually took took out the recommendation um, which has been discussed in a number of previous mail threads and, and, and in this issue. Uh, so we, we don't think that we should actually recommend that. That's, that's for different applications to recommend what, what kind of, how to transport error messages. Test vectors are unchanged just by assuming that C1 is not present. So, it, so it's not changed there. Next slide, please. Uh, and then we have this applicability statement, uh, which uh, is still a topic for discussion, the, sort of the role of this. It, the purpose is to, to harmonize the, um, the agreement somehow between or the expectations between initiator and responder. And we had two parts of text. One was in, in section 3.7, one in appendix C. So now we merged it into essentially everything into uh, 3.7, except for, for example, which remains in appendix C, and we changed the title. So uh, same content, but, but merged. The deterministic CBOR is, this is just a clarification that's always used. It's supposed to be always used, uh, in particular for, for credentials. Uh, when the credentials are encoded, we refer to deterministic encoding. Three new appendices, uh, one on message deduplication, which address the, this idempotency issue, which we are coming back to. Uh, we turns out, so th this is a result of this uh, small design team uh, working on that issue. And it's actually not an idempotency 
solution. It's, it's more uh, how to handle duplicate messages uh, without duplicating processing. So that's the first draft of that. Please have a look. Uh, that uh, appendix D, I think. And there is an appendix now containing all CDDL definitions for each reference. And there's an appendix with a change log to simplify the um, when new versions are coming out. I removed one section, which um, which was somehow circular. It sort of listed documents which referenced ad hoc. I don't think we need that. Um, there is some new text on TEEs, and we're still struggling with the formulations there. That was based on a comment by Stefan. Um, and yes, so and other comments we got from from Peter van der Stock and Marco Tilocco, which we are very happy with also, and we uh, tried to clarify that. Uh, some updated references, mainly splitting things from COSI into the new two COSI drafts, 8152 bits. So that's about the changes. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, so let's go to the issues. Uh, okay, so let me share my browser. So there has been, uh, we have actually been getting quite a lot of new issues, which is great, means that people are a lot of people are implementing and analyzing uh, the ad hoc protocol. And there is no, no major issues. I think all issues are minor, smaller optimization and a lot of how to interact with transport. Um, so, John, do you want to guide me uh, what issues to uh, to present? I mean, I have a list here uh, that we sent earlier on to the uh, to the mailing list uh, with issue numbers. So, do you want to go in order or? Yeah, I guess we can take them from the. I think ad hoc and availability here was on the list. Yes, that was the first one. Yeah. Uh, so this is. A new issue opened by me. I realized that um, while reviewing the ad hoc document again, I realized that ad hoc says that as soon as you get any kind of processing, uh, the processing fails in any way, you must discontinue the protocol and send an error. Uh, this is a simple solution, but it also means that if any attacker sends a single byte to the port number and IP address where you are supposed to receive an ad hoc message, processing will fail and you will discontinue the protocol. So it makes ad hoc um, uh, uh, vulnerable a bit to denial of service attacks. So I think it might make sense to soften this a bit and make uh, allow the implementation to determine more when it discontinues the the protocol. Um, so just to make sure I understand this correctly, since the errors are not cryptographically protected, you're saying that an attacker can can forge an error and discontinue the execution of the protocol. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yes, that also. So two parts, an attacker can, can uh, forge a um, message three or message four, like far down in the ad hoc processing. Let's say they forge message four, they are send a, they don't even need to try to sort, forge it. They are send a random byte, which is would be an invalid message four. And then the protocol would terminate. And similarly, they could send a false error. And then I also think in some place, ad hoc says that if you receive an error, you must terminate yeah. the protocol. Well, I think for errors, isn't it the case that we actually mentioned this? So we say that uh, mm -hmm. the receiver should treat an error as an indication that it may try to continue the protocol. Yeah. That may be the case. But for, for a forged message, 
two, three, four, we say that you must terminate. Um, and you terminate by sending an error, correct? Yeah, yes, that's that's currently how it's, I mean, the general processing is that you terminate and send an error. Okay. So could we, yeah, could we soften this in the same way as as for the error message? Like we say it should and you, you may not or something like that. That would be my suggestion. Then I added here discussion that we could add a Mac to error messages, but I don't think just wanted to start a discussion here in the issue on that, but I don't think it's worth adding that complexity. But what would we gain? I guess that's the question. If we were to pro protect cryptographically the uh, DRM messages, then you can vary. It would not be a possible to. Then we would end up in something like TLS. So the, in the beginning, TLS error messages are not cryptographically protected, uh, and later on some of the error messages are cryptographically protected so then you can verify that the error message actually come from from the other party um, yeah so i think steven has a comment steven do you want to go ahead yeah just a question and uh, apologies if this is stupid by well be so so there's a difference between tls and ipsec in that ipsec you may get unexpected traffic at the, the same interface as you would expect in crypto traffic. With TLS, generally, you only expect the traffic that's part of the TLS session because of the transport issues. For ad hoc app, or applications using ad hoc, what's the expectation? Is it that there should or should not be the ability to have unprotected traffic mingled with protected traffic? Or is that always going to be disallowed because of something else? Don't think I really understood the question. But I guess Edog is more similar. I talked about TLS, but Edog is more similar to DTLS in that you don't have a streaming um, transport under. Um, sure, but uh, so I guess the thing is, will applications multiplex ad hoc protected traffic and other traffic? on the same port number, for example? Or do we know, or do we need to support both? Do we only need to support cases where there's no such multiplexing? That probably someone else can answer better than me, but it's fairly obvious at least that an attacker could inject some traffic on the same port and so on. Okay, so okay, Karsten says uh, occasionally you'll see stone or turn traffic. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I guess if you see if you see stone and turn, it as we have we have very to say space we have very small identifiers minimum, so it's. If you start sending just random data, it will be quite likely that you will, not unlikely that you will get the collision pretty soon. Like, um, and an attacker can of course observe the connection identifiers and send something that will be processed as message three or message four. So we, we designed the, the initial bytes of uh, co-op in such a way that we can uh, tolerate simultaneous stun turn traffic, co op traffic, and DTLS traffic on the same port pair. So, what, what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, th these use cases exist, and typically you would sort the traffic before you start interpreting it as ad hoc. Okay, so that, so that implies that you, you know, not ad hoc necessarily, but some application using ad hoc might have to 
do some trickery like was done with web sockets or uh, or or just otherwise be able to demultiplex. Right. So yeah, yeah, I think that that sounds like something worth noting. But I I would expect that traffic that actually makes it to the ad hoc handling um, is either genuine or is an attack. Okay, yeah, that's good conclusion. Um... Okay, so John, so this comment here that I'm showing on GitHub, uh, this is the proposal for the new text if I'm uh, reading this correctly. Uh, so do you want people to comment on the GitHub issue or do you want to resolve? Uh... Yeah, I think uh, commenting on the GitHub issue, I guess the point with this in taking this up here is to highlight that this is a new issue. We won't yeah. uh, comment. I think it's too early to conclude. Yeah, yeah. I concur with that conclusion. Yes. I think so... we can. There's no more comments. I guess we can take the next issue. So the next issue I have in this list is 100 scope of the applicability statement. Do you want to say a few words? Yeah. So this is also me. I commented my old recognition of the applicability statement when it was first created was that it was an appendix listing things that you need to agree on otherwise uh, yeah or you need to at least support the same things other things otherwise obviously things will not work then in at least in uh, pre version 6 version this had changed to a to um, basically a policy framework where you were required to always verify that the cipher suit and the type of credentials and so on is was allowed for the part you were talking to and that uh, that made me a bit um, I don't think that might be a good idea to mandate this this seems like policy functionality that is for example not included in TLS which m might be done but is probably not a mandatory thing to done and should probably be outside of the body of ad hoc. Yeah. But this statement has no, now been tuned down a bit. Yeah, I think it's important to, to actually get the assurance level you need. Uh, so in the end, what, what's said in the sentence needs to be true, but that sentence, of course, needs can be interpreted in, in a rather draconian way. I mean, all TLS implementations allow you to switch off certain cipher suites for your application, and I would expect a, an ad hoc implementation to allow that as well. Yes, I have another problem with this uh, applicability statement. I'm not clear how uh, an initiator and a responder uh, agree about the applicability statement or either learns about the, the applicability statement of the other. I don't see the mechanism. But that, that's the same problem we have in TLS. So, so we suddenly have TLS implementations that have worked together for 10 years and now somebody switches off SSL version 3 and uh, yeah. suddenly they no longer talk to each other. So that, that's not a new problem. No, it's not a new problem, but nevertheless, uh, why repeat it here, then there's no problem. Would a, a one byte profile in the first message help with an IANA registry and et cetera? Is that what Peter is after? Yes, I, I would like that actually. I mean, the way you can choose between the different um, messages, uh, you have to. Well, no, you wouldn't switch. be choose. You wouldn't be choosing. The initiator would be picking one. Okay. And well, if he gets it wrong, then he's toast. Okay. But at least that's, the responder okay would be able me. to say, would be able to say, I, I heard from this guy using this obsolete uh, uh, thing, and I declined to talk to them. That will be, I, as for me, that will be understandable. Then I will get a message about this will be supported by me and the other can say, well, not by me, that's it. 
I still have one problem though, that is the C1, because the C1 is either there or not, and it's very difficult then to agree on it. Yeah, yeah, I think I think uh, I mean this is really good that we have this discussion now. This is I think the proposal of adding a byte uh, to message one is is a little bit contradicting to what the direction John is proposing in this issue here is to to make it I mean to make it less of a um, well you can correct me if I'm wrong John but I, I get the impression that this is more like we need to it needs to be clear that certain things. Are agreed between initiator and responder, but having an extensive or exhaustive list of what that exactly is and and how those are configured may not be in the scope of this document or, or the purpose to transport information about that in the protocol. But that's I mean this is the discussion we're having. Yeah, uh, uh, my comment was mostly that this had um, had the applicability statement had grown in. Uh, direction that I don't think was was we, we, it has grown and become bigger than what it was when we agreed to have this appendix at some point ago I, I don't I don't have any strong feelings what's the right thing but I think we should be careful to when I read this it seemed like you need to implement some big machinery uh, and do a lot of checks and that seemed expensive in terms of code and memories. I don't think anything like that should be mandatory, but maybe you can read this applicability statement in different ways. If it's just you have a profile which allowed cipher suits that you use for all clients, that's of course not having that you need to have. Yeah. And with, with regards to your, your question, Peter, about C1 there, whether it's present or not. The, the basic assumption with the applicability statement is that it's somehow understood from the transport. I mean, maybe it's the um, support number or URI or something you're using that that should from that from which it should be clear what what is the what are the different how are the different parameters set. So you should know that when you receive message one, first of all, this is a, this is this is an ad hoc message, right? And and then. This is message one, which has these where, where the applicability statement says that null should not be present or something like that. Yeah, I understand. But um, what I see is that um, now I have a state machine which looks at the different uh, message that can come. But if one message uh, gets in, is delayed for an interminable time, and then all of a sudden comes in while the whole connection has been forgotten, forgotten then i don't know what to do with the message i don't know if it's a message zero or a message one or if it's a message three i mean it's very difficult to decide i mean it can only do by doing well let's parse it as a message one and oh it doesn't work as a message one let's try a message three oh no it's complete nonsense i mean you get that kind of behavior but peter to me this is a separate problem from the one that we are discussing right i believe we have ah, yes i understand but i uh, i agree but i mentioned it in connection with the applicability statement as it is part of it yeah i yes this to add more more to message one seems to go it is just adding more to message one and we recently got the comment, I think it was from Malisha to try to remove corre correlation, which is one thing that is coded in message uh, one already. So it seems to be a bit different ideas. I think we need definitely need more discussions on, on this. So regarding the uh... So regarding the correlation parameter, I mean, John, my point on that issue was that uh, I was just uh, probing for consensus. If we want that complexity at the cost of one extra byte in message two and message three, because uh, the complexity seemed uh, extensive to me. For, for So I wasn't sure if we wanted to include that in the protocol. Uh, so that's kind of separate from this discussion time. I, I don't see the connection with this. Uh, but uh, yeah, so Stephen is posting on the chat that uh, yeah, we have 7 minutes to go. So, uh, regarding, regarding this particular issue. Uh, 
I do not hear consensus, a clear consensus to move forward. I, I propose we continue discussing this on the on the GitHub page, and uh, because there are no comments so far, so I invite uh, both Karsten and uh, and uh, Peter to leave their comments on this on this issue. Does that work for everyone? I hear no objections. So, uh, John, do you want to move forward? Uh, yeah. Okay. Move so forward. the next issue I see on my list is ninety-seven. So yes, this is the ad hoc exporter issue. John, do you want uh, do you want to say a few words or? Yeah, sure. So this was a comment from Malisha and Kartik and Timothy that. Uh, that ad hoc does not give any recommend requirements or guidance on how to use this label and it, that it should be forbidden to use it twice. And then I tried to discuss a little bit more what should be forbidden, not like a single application could want to use it twice, but two different applications should, of course, not have a collision. Uh, and then maybe we want to have a IANA register for the label, uh, but that also means that the label is uh, less flexible for the application. So then we might want to have still let the application add things to the label and then two different options. We make a IANA register for labels and then we add a context parameter to the exporter that would be a technical change or we make an IANA register for prefix labels and we let the application add any append anything to uh, the label um, this has both of these approaches has recently been discussed in emu um, but we did not do the prefix solution because TLS labels are not prefixes. Uh, problem with context in TLS is that some implementation decided to not implement context. So if you want to use the context in the TLS exporter, you, you, you are limited to uh, certain TLS implementations. Uh, so, uh, I think we agree that this is a problem that we need to solve. Uh, both of the, my understanding is that both proposed solutions work and it's more in, uh, in terms of usability, uh, where the challenge arises. So, uh, I propose we keep discussing this on GitHub. I, my personal opinion with uh, hats off is that a context parameter, a separate parameter would make more sense. But this is just purely usability, usability uh, aspect. Yeah, but uh, you agree that a separate context parameter is required if we if we do a label IANA register. Yes, yes, I understand that. This I think this is perfectly acceptable. So we define labels in a registry for different applications. So this is hard coded kind of in the registry. And then we still let the applications decide on their per need basis how if they want different keys with a given uh, with a given ad hoc session, which which uh, context parameter allows them to do. So yeah. to, to me that makes sense. I don't think there are any other comments on this. No, seems like context adding IANA registry in the context is the working assumption at the moment. Right. Yes, so let's propose that on the GitHub, wait a couple of uh, days, weeks, and then we can maybe resolve it. Great. Okay, so we have two minutes to go. Uh, I think that is, um, maybe it's better to stop now. We didn't get too many. I think issues. we just got yeah. the comment from Kirsten that we should uh, register labels, prefixes. Yeah. Or oh, I did not no. see that comment. I don't see it in the I chat. The email. Oh. That Carson comments on the issue in GitHub. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, I see. I see. So yes. Carson uh, preferred a different thing. Yeah, uh, but that's good. Let's discuss it on GitHub.
Okay, so then I propose that we stop with the issues. Maybe uh, let's plan for the next steps. Yeah, uh, I have a proposal. Yes. Um, so it seems that I mean there is a number of issues that we sort of we, that relates to each other that we always uh, run into. I mean at this at this stage we have run into the, the things related to uh, applicability statement, uh, the correlation factor, and what and the optional elements in the protocol and the message size targets. So I think we should have a small design team working on that um, soon. And that's I mean it's open. Sorry, small design team. Uh, I mean, we should have a design meeting, like open open up, like we had in Hackathon. We had a great discussion with all the implementers, but not we could have the same, not restricted to implementers, those who want to participate, and 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 we try to progress these issues in uh, in a coherent way. Uh, yeah, I think I think that is a good point. So, do you want to have like a design team meeting before the next interim or? Yeah, I think, yes, I think, I mean, there are two things. There's, there's an interrupt test going to be um, doodled for mid-May. Mm -hmm. And maybe in the same, same time frame, we could have uh, this meeting and then we could report on the results. Both of The them. design team meeting, okay. Yes, as well, bo both of them in mid-May, if that's okay with, what, what do other people think? I think the hackathon, the meeting during the hackathon was very useful for getting all the developers and have quite unlimited time to discuss certain implementation related issues. I think that's a good idea. Something you don't really can do during a, a limited time of an interim. Okay, I agree. So then I propose this as the next step. So first, uh, maybe we should plan for an interim uh, early June, I propose, uh, and then uh, or end of May. And then, so that we can have both the interrupt report and the design team meeting uh, uh, reported uh, for that interim. And in parallel, just after the meeting, we can coordinate your on, on forming the design team. And it would be useful if you could maybe summarize all the issues that you want this design team to tackle so that we uh, reach out to the, uh, to the right people uh, to form this design team. Does that work? Yes, that's that works with me. I, I note that Stephen proposed we should do issues in the beginning of the agenda next meeting, yeah. and maybe we could have a longer interim next time as well. So we can schedule for two hours. Yes, uh, next interim. That that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Want want to point out two things. Two of the there are already pull requests for two of the issues. One is this. Uh, suggestion from Malicia to change the transcript hash uh, uh, format so to have some intermediate values to make it simpler and save memory. There's al al already a pull request for that. And the other pull request is a suggestion from Christian related to an issue to change the connection ID encoding um, to a simpler format. Uh, and reduce complexity. I think both of these are great and basically ready to merge as, as if people agree. Uh, then for for the future, I think now we're discussing byte sizes and uh, optimization. For for the near future, we should decide what exact levels we are optimizing for uh, when. In the requirements phase a year ago, we decided that 45 was the um, number of bytes uh, for five hops 60 that we would should should meet. We are currently at 46 bytes, so we would actually have to optimize at least one more byte to meet that. But we're also seeing discussion that some of the optimization is already a bit too complex and people would rather have a protocol with like 47, 48 bytes uh, to skip some complexity. I think that we should decide on in the next half year or something because th that will lead to technical issues, uh, changes. Um, 
Okay, yeah, yes, John, I see your point. So this was one of the inputs to the working group, essentially the limits on message sizes coming from different use cases where Red Hawk is expected to be used. One of this is sixth-ish where we consider the use case with five hops and the uh, the limiting uh, message size were there what there was in case of a downward traffic and uh, we made some assumptions uh, to and arrived at a figure of 45 bytes so uh, uh, we can we can of course reopen the, this discussion and see if these assumptions that we made back at the time still make sense and uh, come back to the working group I, I think this is something uh, that we can coordinate offline Oh, great. Okay. So with that, uh, I uh, do we have any other business? So I hear none. So uh, as action point for the chairs, we were scheduled the next interim for the end of May, beginning of June. Uh, we will uh, coordinate with uh, Joran and John on forming a design team to tackle a set of issues that are pending and important for the progress of the implement oh, for the progress of the specification. So final the question. Final question. Yes. Mar Marco, would you send out a doodle for the interrupt test? I'll set it up. Yes. Thank you very so much. Thank I you. understood correctly that you planned the interrupt for mid-May, right? Around mid-May, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so let's coordinate the interim with that and the design team. Okay, so thank you all for, for attending and uh, let's keep the discussion going on GitHub and on the mailing list. Thank you all. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye.